of the Mike Huckabee Show on this September 11th, 12 years ago today, a day that all of us will, will certainly remember. And it's also a day that uh, created a real uh, special, uh, I guess, burden in the heart of Dr. Zudi Jasser, who is our guest now. He's the founder and president of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy. Uh, Dr. Jasser is a first-generation American Muslim. His parents fled Syria back in the mid-1960s in order to experience real freedom. And uh, the organization, American Islamic Forum for Democracy, was founded in the wake of 9-11 to help people understand that not all Muslims uh, are terrorists. And Rudy, uh, J Zudi Jasser is perhaps the most significant voice uh, that I know in the country, a good friend, I uh, was on my television show this weekend, but unfortunately, as it often is the case with TV, we never have enough time to talk. I'm delighted to welcome him here. Dr. Jasser, welcome, and it's great to talk to you again. Well, it's great to be with you again, Governor, on this uh, day that uh, so changed the, the lives of Americans, and and uh, our prayers go out to all the families. I, I want to talk about the president's uh, speech last night, his uh, his plans on Syria. I know you and I had a chance to visit a little bit about it on Saturday. And you've been supportive of uh, taking some military action in Syria. For you, it's a very different perspective because uh, you have family who are still there and understand how brutal the Assad regime is. But did the president make his case last night? No, he didn't, uh, unfortunately. And it's made uh, the, the life even harder for those of us that have been clear from three months into the revolution that uh, there is no negotiation with uh, uh, terrorist states like Syria uh, and like Assad, and that there is no political solution. Uh, he gave a speech last night that he should have given in uh, August 2011 when he said the policy of this administration was regime change. And now all of a sudden he's seen our policy switch in the last three days. In the same speech yesterday, I got actually four different messages, one about pause, one about uh, chemical weapons being under the uh, control of the U.N., and uh, another about a strike. So I can't figure out which direction he's going. And yet, you know, I can tell you firsthand from family that uh, were in prison and tortured and have dealt with this regime, uh, these guys laugh. And this is a little different than Qaddafi or Saddam, who who uh, uh, barely had any lights on in their head. Uh, this guy, Assad, is a physician, uh, no different than Mengele, who works with uh, Hitler. I mean, this guy's smart and, and evil. And uh, he and his he and his pal Putin are playing us for fools, and they've changed all of a sudden a strike that was supposed to punish and even degrade his capabilities into uh, uh, somewhat of a uh, no longer regime change, no longer a strike. I mean, we're on pause. I mean, I don't know where he's headed. And you know what? This is going to unleash. I mean, we were talking 5,000 lives a week being killed in Syria. It is going to be ramped up over the next few weeks to months when uh, Assad realizes that uh, he and Putin have the upper hand. And the era of American, you know, when my family came, as you mentioned, it was not only about American freedom, but America was the leader of freedom in the world. That when they had a doubt of where to go, it was to America. I think that era is ending. I, I was in tears last night listening, saying, I think the era that America is the uh, defender of uh, those who want freedom around the world, not always with boots on the ground, but at least from the bully pulpit of the White House. I mean, he didn't make the case very well about the threat of Iran, about what's at stake in Syria. And I think if he had made the case well, he would have had so many more supporters from both sides of the aisle. And I think there were a lot of people, uh, myself included, that were willing to give him the benefit of the doubt and listen to him. Uh, I've not been in favor of action in Syria because I didn't have confidence that this president had a clear objective in mind. He had never communicated exactly what it was we were going to do. And what I did hear any specifics, it was the John Kerry kind of, it's going to be unbelievably small. And I'm thinking, well, when you go in and announce in advance that you're going to take a military action that is so insignificant that it won't even leave a mark, you know, then you wonder, what's the point? I mean, that doesn't really frighten Assad. He's, he's delighted to swat that one away and then go ahead and do what he wants to do. Yeah, the, um, our president, our commander-in-chief, does not seem to have the confidence that uh, uh, our military has, I believe. And uh, he doesn't know how to lay that out. And uh, I, I believe he views the world 
as a post-American world and just by necessity because of uh, Assad's uh, use of chemical weapons. You remember, Assad used the chemical weapons. Uh, some have uh, uh, been talking about conspiracy theories and others, or maybe the rebels. Bottom line is that it was used outside Damascus because that's the center hold of the government, and they were on the verge. They wanted to make a statement that if they lose Damascus, they've lost the war, so they thought that would have a significant deterrent effect in Syria. So that should have been uh, the... There should have been ground laid months before by this administration that uh, uh, you could then have uh, uh, gotten American opinion to move forward on a concerted strike, no different than President Bush did for months before we finally went into Iraq. And that was a ground operation. And all we're talking here is, as General Keene has laid out, there's a lot of military experts that have laid out a two-week operation done right that could shift the calculus in Syria and then lay out how we can begin to find our allies uh, um, possibly vet moderates, and lay out the fact that if we don't do anything, the choice of doing nothing doesn't absolve us of responsibility, that Syria will continue to go south, will continue to be a magnet for al-Qaeda, and then export al-Qaeda around the world out of Syria. So at some point we're going to have to try to minimize the, the terror threat that's coming in and out of Syria. I'm visiting with Dr. Zudi Jasser, and we're talking about uh, the president's speech on Syria last night. Uh, one of the questions that I have for you, Dr. Jazzer, have, have we waited too late? I mean, if, if we had done something two years, 18 months, even maybe a year ago, the rebel forces in Syria were fairly well defined as being truly rebel forces against Assad. Uh, but I think people like al-Qaeda saw an opening, uh, saw how the Muslim Brotherhood were able to co-opt the freedom effort in Egypt and use it for their own evil purposes. Uh, has that movement of dissonance uh, and, and particularly terrorists grown so much that now helping them and equipping the other side ends up not helping a whole lot and, in fact, empowering people who are still our enemies? I mean, that's, that's a perfectly sound question, and that uh, there's no doubt that that's uh, factual, is that the longer we wait, uh, the more... Uh, radicalized the Syrian population becomes. But if you look at numbers, uh, Governor, yes, it uh, uh, would have been far better to the regional interest, uh, not only because Syria is very diverse, more diverse than any other country. It could have had a, a more pluralistic result. Uh, the Brotherhood is far less powerful in Syria than it is in Egypt. Uh, but having said that, two years of radicalization have empowered al-Qaeda. And this was the playbook of, of the Arab dictators. Is page one is let al-Qaeda out of prisons, let them into through the borders to uh, legitimize emergency law and, and legitimize a, a ruthless uh, suppression of an uprising, and uh, through the dust you lose all the moderates. But I will tell you, if you look at the numbers, Syria is 23 million people. You've got local coordination committees, not only in the small towns where the revolution began, but in the big towns. And just like in Egypt, where you saw 5 to 10 million people walk in the streets uh, against the Brotherhood, those millions are still in Syria that uh, are, are helping the Free Syria Army with food and, and uh, replenishments, uh, everything short of military supplies. They're not active soldiers, but uh, you've got millions in Damascus and Aleppo. We knew, the Syrian population knew, that once Damascus and Aleppo got involved in the revolution, which took 18 months, but once they did, Assad was done. It was just the question was how much of Syria was he going to take with him? So far, he's taken 110,000 with 4 million displaced. It may end up being half the population with millions that he'll take with him until he's gone if Russia and Iran continue to supply him. So, you know, I think the calculus is that uh, he will be gone. The question is how radicalized will the population be? And I think the majority of them are not al-Qaeda. And uh, many of the Free Syria Army have told us our first enemy is Assad. Afterwards, we'll deal with al-Qaeda, which will be our second enemy. One of the issues I don't hear a lot about is the refugee situation. So many uh, Syrian uh, rebels, their families and others are, are just trying to get out of there because they know that their days are numbered as long as Assad is in power. And that's overflowing into both Lebanon and Jordan, neither of which is in a position to handle an influx of, of people who, uh, who come really with nothing but what's on their backs. So t talk about how big a problem that is and... Is there anything that the U.S. could be doing to help alleviate what is now becoming a massive refugee issue? 
that is such an important part of the equation and, and another part I, I wish the president had laid out yesterday. You're talking about four million displaced, uh, half a million in Turkey, uh, three to four hundred thousand in Jordan, um, you know, two million internally displaced refugees throughout the area. And the bottom line is they're beginning to destabilize those countries around them, especially Jordan. And uh, those refugees are going to uh, not have the, the foundational roots in order to uh, maintain sort of a positive outlook for reform. And actually, they're going to see a, a backward shift towards uh, a militancy, some of them. Uh, you'll find in some of the work we've done in the U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom, we found that uh, the Christians and other minorities are not even self-identifying among the refugees because they're afraid of persecution. The sectarian violence is increasing. And yet, from an American taxpayer perspective, Governor, we're dumping hundreds of millions, if not billions, into their their help, which is a wonderful humanitarian thing that America does. But we should look at the numbers and say, if we dump that money into the refugee situation without treating the primary cause, which is Syria, and the destabilization that these refugees are doing to the region around Israel, at some point, maybe the investment will be better to actually get back to the president's original plan, which was regime change, and then those refugees will go back. Our family that I talked to are not leaving their homes in Damascus or Aleppo yet, because once they do, the homes get ravaged and taken over by military or by, you know, uh, radicals. And, and, you know, the situation is very unstable both inside and around. And we need a plan, not just to dump uh, a lot of the money that we're doing through USAID into the refugees in the region. And, and the president indicated the last night that this whole idea of the Russians putting pressure on Syria and containing the chemical weapons with an international committee, that, that was something that the president had talked to Putin about when they were together. And that, that just didn't even have any credibility at all in that when John Kerry surfaced that whole idea, uh, it immediately was walked back by the State Department as just being some uh, inadvertent uh, sort of off-the-cuff remark. I, I guess I'm just struggling to figure out how the president can stand there and last night at all but take credit for uh, this peaceful solution, which dealing with Putin may not be such a peaceful solution after all. Governor, your instincts are a thousand percent correct. Let me give you just a quick history. My grandfather in the late 40s worked on trying to get democracy and, and didn't work because of the military coups and then ended up being in prison for two or three years from 60 to 62 and then escaped. His main, one of the reasons I became a Reagan Republican growing up in Wisconsin was my grandfather told me the greatest evil that was destroying the Middle East was the Soviets. The Syrian military, all of the, the methods that they use for shooting people in the streets and, and uh, the genocidal operations that they do, the silver-haired generals that are in the current military are all Soviet-trained, and that relationship is the old historic relationship Putin did not get the memo that the Cold War was over. This is Cold War 2.0 that you're seeing, and all he's doing is covering his continued remaining foothold in the Middle East, and that's the relationship that they have. And the president, our president, does not want to acknowledge that this old relationship is trying to say that the American superpower no longer exists, and Putin is basically saying he controls. There's an economic relationship there, a triangular one, by the way, between Russia, Iran, and Syria with oil, with uh, billions of dollars a month involved. So this is the, you know, the, the gorilla, 800-pound gorilla in the room that nobody wants to talk to. All the meanwhile, Russia's methods of dealing with radical Islam, look at Chechnya. One of the largest sources of radical Islam around the world is coming up from within Russia. So to say that Russia knows how to help American interests against radical Islam, I think, is is uh, uh, not founded, and we forget the, the historic relationship there that has always been anti-American. Well, your perspective is uh, very, very keen and one that uh, we, we value very much. Uh, appreciate your being with us, Dr. Zudi Jasser, our guest here on the Mike Huckabee Show. I want to encourage you, if you have not read his book, The Battle for the Soul of Islam, American, An American Muslim Patriot's Fight to Save His Faith, uh, it is a remarkably good read. Also, the website aifddemocracy.org. And uh, Dr. Jasser, again, great to have you here. Thank you so much, Governor. God bless.